What's up guys? It's Kelsey and I'm here with the cat. What's up everyone? Oh my god. Um, welcome back to Cad Calls with Kelsey. Today we're talking to Jaime Munoz. Okay, um, I'm super excited for this video because uh, Jaime was like the poster child of Freeze. Is that just me? And I wanted to go to Freeze specifically to see the Pitts booth, to see Jaime, and I got free tickets and I was like super excited and it turns out they were like only tickets to the back lot and I didn't get to see him and I was devastated. So getting to actually sit down with Jaime and talk to him about his practice was such a unique privilege. Um, his work is exceptionally beautiful. Today we get into his use of symbolism, his background in construction and the commercial arts, and his exploration of larger cultural phenomena like blood memory and colonial histories. It's a really excellent conversation. Uh, again, I am so, so privileged to have been able to sit down and have this conversation with Jaime. Oh my gosh, I'm like so happy about it. All right, everybody, uh, we get to do today's interview in the studio as well. Uh, so. Let's get started. Okay, um, so I just want to start by asking you a little bit about generational trauma and blood memory, as you've described uh -huh. in your work, and how that provides both okay. an entry into the work and also um, your personal relationship with these more collective histories. My relationship to art in general, like, the, like there is a relationship to my trauma, because like when I first started uh, making, it was kind of uh, like uh, like therapeutic, you know? So I feel like early on, I kind of um, like conditioned that relationship to my work and kind of exploring these, uh, these concepts that I was trying to understand for myself, especially mm -hmm. like concepts around uh, identity. Because mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of contradiction and like trauma connected to uh, like the co colonial history. Mm -hmm. And then also trauma connected to the culture that resonated after the period of modernity and like the me mechanization of, of like human labor mm -hmm. and commodity labor. So mm -hmm. all of it is kind of con like kind of tied into there. So when, when I think of generational trauma, uh, I, I kind of think of that like th there is like a chronology that I think of or like a timeline. Mm -hmm. where, you know, I, I could look at, like, the colonial period and kind of, like, explore themes around that. And, and then oftentimes that's where I'm kind of looking at a lot of, like, like religious iconography and trying to juxtapose it with pre-colonial spiritual iconography. Or if I'm kind of, like, fast-forwarding to, like, the period of, like, modernity uh -huh. and kind of look at ideas around commodity labor and um, concepts around like the, like the human condition, like the machine is like an index of modernity and commodity labor. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about um, using religious iconography, which is present here, but I, I'm interested in why you juxtapose that with commodity iconography. Um, like there's sort of worshiping going on on both sides, which I think is really interesting. Could you speak to that a little bit and why you decide to do that in the work? Well, yeah, um, so, so like this work is, is not so much focusing on like the colonial aspect around spirituality or religion. This, one's, this one is more commenting on commodity labor, but using Mesoamerican iconography is mm -hmm. just kind of part of like the imagery that I like to use for a composition. When I look at when I look at my own identity around those histories, mm -hmm. I kind of see it as um, kind of like like two things going on at the same time. Like one aspect is like the organic and like your organic body, mm -hmm. and then the other the other the other side of it is like the de dehumanization side of it, where you're kind of treated like a machine. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes when I use the horse, I'm trying to juxtapose it with something mechanical. 
Mm-hmm. And so like in this one, mm-hmm. I have um, like an automotive part, which is, which is a, 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 the, the timing chain cover with the water pump on mm-hmm. it. And mm-hmm. next to it, that's uh, Tlaloc, which is the rain god. So there's like a connection there. But, but mainly I was kind of just going along the same themes where I, where I juxtaposed like an organic symbol of commodity labor and like a mechanical. You know, explore, so exploring this topic of commodity labor, I kind of adopted this uh, term, uh, it's like more specific to like a work, working class uh, experience that's based in like necessity, you know? And you have experience in, in the construction industry and in the commercial arts. Well, yeah, that that period when I, when I was doing manual labor, um, mm-hmm. like really really impacted me, you know, because that that is where I kind of felt like I, I worked for this construction company in Fontana called Slater. While I worked there, I worked alongside a lot of immigrants. Like the feeling of being like disposable, like your only purpose is for like manual labor and like the treatment you experience there, it 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 impacted me, you know. Mm-hmm. You know, especially given like the context of like w- like working class history in the United States. You know, the period of the Industrial Revolution and all the exploitation that was going on during that period, political literature that was going on that that kind of uh, like favored the working class experience. While at the same time experiencing that treatment, I was like exploring these concepts and trying to make work that that expressed. That. And the symbolism of the grid relates specifically to that history, correct? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Like the the grid is indexical of like modernity, but like when I started using it, I felt like there's already been a narrative around the grid. I kind of wanted to have like a different entry point and like why I use it that was like deeper than just modernity, mm-hmm. and um. Or, or not necessarily deeper, but just more unique to me in my experience. That also exists in nature, like it, with sacred geometry. I so, see. like that, that's something that's pretty interesting too. Yeah, I think that relates actually to this piece and the cross as this mechanical uh, object. What is this? Say that's that. a, um, a hollow mortise chiseler, and like oh. I, I, I chose, I decided to do that. So, like this piece, I'm like commenting on like commodity labor. But, but again, kind of always like bringing in religious iconography, because I feel like that's like an entry point. Well, it's like mainly, mainly the demographic of people that I kind of grew up with, the people that I'm like closest to. Like one thing that I try to be really conscious of is making work that's relatable. Mm-hmm. Um, so like in this piece, I'm trying to make a comment around commodity labor and, I'm, and I did it my interpretation of the crucifixion of Christ. Mm-hmm. And, but also to like trying to express a sentiment around the human condition. And so like Jesus Christ was a carpenter, so he was a laborer. And I feel like a lot of people who, uh, I, you know, I grew up with kind of like identify with that narrative, you know? Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so that machine is used for woodworking. So I felt like, oh, okay, the, the, this, and it already looks like a cross, so I, I, I felt like it it um, worked well together to put them together. Yeah, that's really beautiful symbolism. Um, you know, this sort of economy of labor in your work is something that's really prevalent, obviously. It stretches into the way that you create these works because they're so laborious. Um, it, it's um, mixed media. Um, some of it's airbrushed. Uh, but a lot of it is applied like um, by hand with a brush. Mm. Like so all, you, like all, like all of the gradients I do um, with a brush. I, like a lot of people think like that's done with uh, an airbrush, but yeah, it's not it enough like to it. get like a large surface area. Yeah. So I think this is a really excellent example of of the meticulousness um, uh-huh. that you uh, work with. The gradient that you see in the background, like the, the green, white, and red, I, I did that with a, with a brush. And I can show you, I'll show you. See? Oh my goodness, you made that? Yeah. See, wow. So I, just, I just kind of um, just attached like a bunch of four inch brushes so that I can uh, like create these like gradients. Oh my goodness. I mean that it really looks airbrushed entirely. Oh. Wow. oh. 
No, so like the only thing airbrushed here is um, the dark blue and then the butterflies. It, but then on top of the butterflies, I, I, I applied like, the, like a glitter. Mm -hmm. That's all, those are the only things that are, that are um, airbrushed and the rest is all done by hand. And then, you know, like the corners, you can't tell in the photo, but that's like paper and velvet flocking. The, the blue. Yes, the flocking. And, the and you also use like textured paste sometimes, correct? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that the pink here? Yep, that's uh, the textured paste. Wow, okay. So, so what is compelling you to use these sort of unexpected materials in the work? You know, I think, I think that's kind of like um, my relationship to building. Mm. Where where I'm kind of building a surface using multiple materials, like something about that feels like satisfying to me than just um, using like one tool and one medium for like a for an entire composition. Like I, like it really because when I look at my identity as an artist, like I'm a multi. I see myself as a multimedia artist. Like I'm I'm not only interested and invested in painting although right now i'm only invested in painting because i'm getting a lot of attention for the painting mm -hmm. but i also love working in ceramics i also love drawing i also love sculpture mm -hmm. and i feel like um being able to use the, the most amount of materials that i can on a painted surface kind of satisfies that for me it's like it, it satisfies me in that way mm. Yeah. yeah, and the stylistic elements of the work really draw from a wide breadth of, of places. I mean, tattoo inspiration, um, textiles, logos, pop culture. Um, could you speak a little bit to why you're choosing those specific things to be inspired by? So, like, starting out, I was more invested in, in the commercial arts, like graphic design. Okay. And um, I was like really interested in poster art, like like from like the sixties and seventies, like the psychedelic stuff. You know, like I'm like interested in those like color palettes and those uh, compositions. Mm -hmm. So I feel like that's like one kind of like layer where where I get inspiration from, and then also too like there was a period where I, I worked in in a tattoo shop, and I. I did that work for a while? I don't know. Like, I'm not consciously trying to be like, I want this or that to be a part of like my aesthetic. I just, uh -huh. it just happens, I guess. I don't know. But that, that is where it comes from. Like, definitely, like, my, like, I guess, like, different periods and like my kind of how related to my work kind of coming out in my paintings, you know? Yeah, yeah. I want to talk about that a little bit because you're obviously working with this more collective history. You're talking about generational trauma, but you're also using memory as a starting point for the work and yeah. reflecting on your history. Oftentimes, like when I'm starting a painting, it's like an intuitive thing. Like, um, and and it starts off like a like an abstract painting in a way where I'm, I'm like first starting off with this like gradient or like the borders. And then I start thinking of like what, what I want to be in the foreground. Mm -hmm. And like that can vary, like depending on the, on the topics that I'm into, in, into, whether it being, you know, the, the, the colonial stuff or the commodity labor mm -hmm. stuff um, or like blood memory. Like when, when I'm accessing that, I'm kind of thinking of something more specific our, our relationship to religion and like the colonial period. Like for example, like if you, if you look at um, the painting um, Sun Worshippers, mm -hmm. like this, this is like the painting where, where I start, where I first started exploring that. Mm -hmm. So, so, so on the top, that's um, uh, uh, Tonatua, the, the um, sun god. Mm -hmm. And then on the bottom, that, that's like an image taken from an event that happened in Portugal where um, there was like an apparition of Fatima and she appeared in the, in the form of a, of a sun, a dancing sun. 
And I kind of felt like that was um, kind of like a moment of blood memory where it's like this like colonized demographic of people that are still relating to like their ancient like religious past, like in like this like unconscious way. Mm -hmm. So like kind of went, like seeing those um, like bridge points to me is like where 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 I'm thinking of like blood memory, mm -hmm. like like the like the, the period the, like the like the areas of our being that are um, like non erasable like they still surface mm -hmm. like almost in the same sense as uh, intergenerational trauma, but like in like a different sense if that makes sense oh yeah totally and i think um to me the process by which you create these in um many many layers feels very connected to generations or sort of an ancestral memory as well um is that something that's intentional no no like the, the, the like like you know like the the process of the work isn't like symbolic of anything in that way mm -hmm. but um but in terms of how I relate to my subject matter, like there is kind of like a, like a timeline that can reflect a, like a layering, you know? Um, Cause you know, at, depending on the composition or the work, like I kind of reference different um, areas of the, the layer, like an onion, I guess. I can see it in that way. If yeah. Wow, these are so beautiful. These are the 2020 works, correct? So I haven't seen any of these. Um, no, no one, no one saw that one. Uh, it, like it was, it, it was taken to freeze, but mm -hmm. it was like sold, but like it was like sold beforehand, and like so they they sh they showed the paintings that that weren't sold. So like this one, this one never had an opportunity to be shown. Mm -hmm. But I really like this painting too. Yeah, this is really beautiful. And I'm noticing that this four corners sort of um, uh, symbology keeps coming up in the work. Um, yeah. what, what is that about? So like um, in terms of like the visual language that I'm sourcing for mm -hmm. all of my work around the topics that we talked about, like um, I'm really interested in the idea of like a symbolism or like coats you know mm -hmm. because you know I'm, I'm using i'm like sourcing this imagery that might be difficult to access for some people mm -hmm. like starting out but then once you become familiar with my work and understand like the visual language of what i'm saying i hope that i can source that and kind of like bringing in um visual iconography that i've been using in that way like mm -hmm. like uh the 20 22r is um uh like the motor that's most desirable in like these toyota pickup trucks that i'm like really fascinated uh -huh. in. and like that's like that's like another side of my interest too that's that's aside from like commodity labor like i'm also really inter interested in like the like the like the working class culture around the fascination of, of like this truck because through like uh, uh, necessity and dependability and functionality, you know, and like LKQ, that's like a that's like a, a, a junkyard. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but I'm not. People, okay, so it's basically um, where people go to like find parts for their automobiles. So it's mainly people who like work on their own cars. Uh -huh. So it's like it's like a big junkyard and people go and try and find their part because it's like the most like cheapest way than buying it new mm -hmm. and um so like lkq is like a junkyard that's like around like all over and then i uh, bringing in like the the horse that's like another like right. um symbol that i use a lot then like flowers i i use that a lot too in my work so i was just kind of thinking of like the visual language and codes and what some of those are for me to kind of like kind of like navigate things for, I guess, my readers. And what about index? This one here. Oh, index. Um, that, that one, I was kind of looking at it from like a, like semiotic per, per perspective of like, like same, same thing, like um, 
signs and symbols and how like to me the image of the horse is indexical of labor like if you look at our relationship to like the domesticated horse like it, it's a relationship of of labor and also technology mm -hmm. before um like the period of like in, like the, the industrial periods where we right. where we like invented steam power where we then uh, like left that technology behind and started using like steam power but at the same time there there's always still been muscle power there too right like, and it's also just an emblem of colonialism really yeah I mean, basically you can't extricate that history from the symbol of the horse some artists that i've talked to have discussed a shift from um working before quarantine and then mm. being quarantined that it actually affects the 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 work um uh semiotically and not just physically mm -hmm. have you noticed anything like that um happen in your work at all um yeah definitely like i feel i feel like um as as an artist like my responsibility is to like reflect our time you know so like the topics that we talked about those are topics that are important to me where i feel like if i'm talking about these things maybe when when visitors go to art that are not usually exposed maybe they'll feel like like they can relate to it a bit more right so but i have been thinking about like the current state of things the the, the current state that we're in and like really feeling like we're in like a transitional period and like trying to wrap my mind around that cuz a lot of the themes and topics that i've been exploring are still like uh relevant now but I feel like there's aspects that I want to talk about in like the future relating to like this new industrial period that we're in that's like changing uh, the way we relate to the world. And, and that's like the internet. Like seeing that, but also seeing like the state of the world, like, like, like climate change, the pandemic, um, uh, like the distribution of like power and wealth and like it's basically what I feel is like that period of modernity, that period of progress is like reaching its limits, like, 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 like physically on the earth and on people. And, and we're, I feel like we're kind of like reaching like an end point, a tipping point. There's like this economist that I've been listening to, his name's Jeremy Rifkin. And he, uh, he, he wrote this book called like the third industrial revolution. Mm -hmm. he's, he's like talking about like the state of the world and how like we're we're like killing it mm -hmm. and like we have like 30 years to ch to like to 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 change our relationship to the world you know and like also like the pandemic and like recently i've been exploring uh the concept of time one being again relating it to like that industrial period and how the concept of time was really implemented on like working class people mm -hmm. to like modify their time. Mm -hmm. And like, I always felt that that was interesting because you know, like if you, if you think of the measurement of time in nature, um, it doesn't, it, it doesn't exist in the same measurable way. Like usually you go by the sun and the moon and it's like a, it's like a period of time. So like when they would tell workers like, oh, come in sunrise, Sunrise is like a period of time. So to commodify their time, they, they started using clocks and time cards and mm. they start at four in the morning. And mm. so thinking of it from that aspect, but then also thinking about it as like an expiration date to like life on earth in a way. And, uh, and then thinking about like this pandemic too, like feeling like very like hopeless in a way, like seeing, like experiencing like life right now, it's like a, it's like it's like really surreal. Like living through like this, like pandemic and feeling like, like we're. It really puts the concept of time in the forefront for me. Awesome! Yeah, it's so exciting to hear about the future of the work too. So I just want to end by asking where we can check you out right now, mid pandemic. Okay, um, well, you can always um, like follow my, my Instagram. Like that's probably like the platform that I like update the most, you know, yeah. so it's convenient. 
Um, and you know, that's um, Flan underscore JM. Yeah. You could check out my website that, that I update periodically. I have all the work from Freeze on there, but I'm probably not going to put the new work for my solo show until after the solo show. When is the solo show going to be? It's going to be sometime in November. I'm not exactly sure what date yet. It's still, we still have time. Right, right. And then your website is? It's um, Jaime Munoz and the number one dot com. All right, everybody. That was the wonderful, talented, amazing Jaime Munoz. Um, I am going to link his website and Instagram in the description as always. I'm also going to link to um, the Pitts website and their Instagram. Be sure to keep an eye on those places for um, Jaime's show in November. Um, it was a pleasure talking to Jaime today and I hope you guys enjoyed this and I will see you all in a couple weeks on Cad Calls with Kelsey.